Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you in the Lord's house today, and uh, I'm glad to be back and um, with you today. We thank the Lord for your uh, praying for you last week. I was ahead in the central time zone, so we were having church before you guys, and then we, when we were out, we were getting ready to snack down on some good, uh, what was it? Oh, Mississippi pot roast. Oh, my sister-in-law made wonderful pot roast. I explained it to the Sunday school class every mouth-watering ingredient. But anyway, while we were having that, you guys were having service, and I remembered even between mouthfuls to pray for you <laughs> to have a good time. And appreciate Matt and Carl and all the folks who uh, stepped in. And I was sorry to not to miss Brother JJ, but I understand he had a, had a really good messages for you and uh, just a really good spirit, isn't he? And he just uh, loves the Lord, and we're thankful for his work and um, in Romania now and Ukraine and... Uh, Keep praying for him and uh, God's blessing. And so uh, I do thank you for praying for my brother. Continue to pray for him. He's in chemo treatment, chemotherapy treatments now every two weeks. So continue to remember to pray for Alan's on. Appreciate that. Uh, let's continue to pray for the hills. Uh, Lindell's had some struggle with his back and also with his feet. He can't get around very well. And I talked to uh, Lori on uh, Friday and she said, yeah, he's uh, struggling a little bit with all of it. So uh, you might can give a encouragement and not he's not up to he wasn't up to talk with me right then he was laying down but um, if you can give him a you can send him a get well card he's been a few weeks now struggling with this so let's remember him if he's listening by way of the live stream we love you brother continue to pray for you and God's help for you well let me share some announcements with you and then we will have uh, uh, our worship time so right after, I think everybody who's been invited, and everybody has been invited, to come, and I have not had an ice cream bar before. I've never been to one. I've had one, but I've never been to one. So I'm looking forward to what this is. I have inside information about the quality of the ice cream. But let me tell you, it is not the $1.99 special Smith's brand. Mm -mm. No, you got to think higher, higher. Get up there with the elite people, with the uh, Nancy Pelosi's of this world, and enjoy the ice cream bar. It's going to be great, and this is all in honor of Sarah getting through school. And so uh, come and enjoy that time right after. Uh, we're finished here. I think it said 1 o'clock, but when we're done, right? Pretty much when we're done. And it might be 1.30. I got a hot message today, and I may go long. I'm kidding. Sort of. Uh, anyway, so remember that. Now, in a couple of weeks, I want you to prepare to bless some Mackenzie Terribio. She's getting ready to go to Bible college. How many didn't know that? Didn't know that about Mackenzie. Yeah, she is going to Heartland Baptist Bible College over in Oklahoma City. And uh, she is leaving on the 14th. So her last Sunday with us will be, I mean, she may have to be there the 14th. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, you know, you can get there in a day's drive to Oklahoma City. So um, she's going to be here on August 11th, still, that's her last Sunday, and we want to encourage her. Uh, I remember when I left to go to Bible College in 1974 from Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, you know, the church patted me on the back and, uh, you know, blessed me and encouraged me, and off I went with uh, $300 and my 63 Volkswagen Bug and my guitar in the back and the few clothes I possessed. I realized how impoverished I was. Everything I own could fit in a Volkswagen Bug. Now everything I own can't fit on a barge. Taking it down the river, if I ever move again, all my books, my goodness, I had to get an extra truck to take my library wherever I went. Anyway, uh, those were the days. It was exciting, but there was also some challenges. So we want to encourage uh, 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 Mackenzie. <laughs> And so we're having a card shower and a fellowship time. I will make sure there's cake there. So I got the snack ladies for all the 11th and there'll be a cake there and we will uh, say goodbye to her. And if you can give her some, some monetary help, that's what the card's about. First of all, say, I'm gonna pray for you because she's gonna need it. And then you can give her some cold hard cash, okay? Help her out a little uh, because she's gonna need that as well. We wanna also pray for James Trivial and his last week was last week. He's in boot camp now in the Navy. so. Pray for James, and then for Carolyn Pace, she is in the hospital again in Peru. This is her second visit from this, uh, uh, this Ramsey uh, Hunt syndrome she has. It's paralyzed her face and, and caused uh, 
loss of hearing in her right ear. Uh, she's been very dehydrated. There's lots of pain involved with this as well. So her, her son, Steve, who's from North Carolina, came up down there when she first had to go in the hospital, and he's extended his stay now. She got out of the hospital and was home, but she, she had to go back because of that. So we'll pray for our missionary, Carolyn Pace, and remember that. Okay, I think that's uh, most of the amount that the choir is not going to practice tonight, choir, so remember that. July birthdays. Uh, Jordan has a birthday on tomorrow. And we have celebrated some with cake already and donuts, it looks like, which is a good way to celebrate. However, Matt has a birthday too. And I understand he did not sing to himself. So <laughs> it's up to us to remedy that, all right? So let's sing happy birthday. And also Pam Terivio has a birthday coming up. So uh, that's on the 4th. Is that 4th next Sunday? It's right on the 4th, isn't it? So we'll save hers till next time. We're going to sing to uh, Matt and Jordan. All right, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Joe. <laughs> that was the signal. All right. We'll work on the timing for next time. All right, Brother Matt, if you'll come, please. Do you know why the word dark is spelled with a K? You can't see in the dark. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Let's stand and sing number 20. Praise him, praise him. Number 20. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, singing me with some some intensive uh, look at Psalm 113 while I was gone, and I want to share it with you this morning in our scripture reading. 113th Psalm says, Praise ye the Lord, praise, O ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, even the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you today for your goodness to us. We thank you for allowing us to come and assemble in this place. Lord, you've been gracious and you've been kind and you've been loving you tell us, Lord, that your anger endures but for a moment, but your long suffering extends to us eternally. And we thank you for that. You have not, you've not dealt with us after our iniquities, but you've given us uh, showers of blessings of your mercy, and we thank you for that, for the forgiveness of God. And we rejoice with the psalmist here, all the servants of the Lord. We promise you, Lord, that we will we'll walk in your ways, and we pray that you would give us your strength to do it. We ask you, Lord, to give us a spirit of revival in our hearts. Lord, for ourselves, we, we can't control everything. We are just uh, a few and, 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 and small and uh, seemingly uh, unnoticeable by the world. But you, God, are our God, and you are the God who answers our prayers. You're the God who hears us. You're the God who lifts us up. And so we give you praise today, Father. We thank you for who you are, and we ask you to meet with us in this service. We pray for those who can't be here. We think of Lyndall Hill and the struggle he's having now with his health. Please be with him. And we pray for others, Lord, who need you in a real particular way now. Uh, for those who may be out because of hindered by providential reasons or whatever, we pray for them. Pray for those who are in the military from our church. We ask you to bless them and that those that are training and getting prepared and those that are already serving, we ask your grace upon them. We thank you, Lord, for the mercies. You've shown, give us your mercies again. May the Spirit work among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Hymn number 89, 89, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, 89.
for our greeting chorus. That's number 24. His name is wonderful. So we'll stand and we'll sing this one time through before we have a time to greet one another. Then we'll come back and sing it a second time. Number 24. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's The rock of all ages, almighty God is he. Bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my His name is wonderful, His name is wonderful.
Thank you. You may be seated. Number 342, he included me, 342. Stand and sing number 295, Wonderful Words of Life, 295. Let's stand. Thank you. 
fearful words of life. So I'm meant to uh, welcome uh, Joe and Julia. It's good to have you guys back. Forgot to do that. And uh, encourage them along the lines of medium salsa tea. It's good. Just give it a try. Good to see you guys. And Alethea is back from camp ministry. Let us give her a hand. We meant to say something about that. And uh, she's going to be greeted with a couple of the compadres who helped out. My two grandsons are coming next weekend to stay with us for a few days, and so they'll be here next weekend. We might try to get them to do a little three-person skit. They're really good at skits, but they like said, no, no, that's not my thing, the skit thing. But maybe we'll get to share something with us next week. But anyway, so we've had people busy and working, serving the Lord. Wherever I've gone, and I was in Texas this week, and everything's big in Texas, uh, but there was a service to the Lord there in the church I saw, and it was a bigger church uh, than ours, but I came back here and I said, there's still people doing stuff uh, and serving here. Um, it's just a matter of uh, not the amount of it, but if it's happening. Jesus said, how much faith do you need to move mountains? Oh, you better have a big, oh, big giant bit of faith, because... That's what the prosperity people say. Your big faith will give you a Palm Springs mansion. That's nothing. A little itty-bitty amount of faith that is biblical will move mountains. And so Jesus said, you got it or you don't. You got it, you use it. It doesn't matter the amount of the people exercising. It matters the amount of faith exercising people. So in order for us to, to, uh, to, to keep continuing on, we need to do what our song says here today, which is keep on the firing line, all right? Okay, I've got to, ready, Sarah, I'll get my All right, two, three, four, five, four. If you're in the battle for the Lord and love, keep on the firing line. If you win, my brother, you must surely fight. Keep on the firing line. There are pretty dangers that we all must face. If we die still fighting, it is no disgrace. Outwards in this service, we will find a place. Oh, keep on the firing line. Oh, you must fight, be brave against the soldier he can trust. Keep on the firing line. If you wear the crown, then bear the cross you must. Keep on the firing line. I was burnt to live for the master dear. Help to banish evil and to spread good cheer. Great will be rewarded for your service here. So keep on the firing line. Oh, you must fight, be brave against all evil. Never run, nor even lag behind. If you would win for God and the right, just keep on the firing line. When we get to 
dear heaven, brother, we'll be glad. Keep on the firing line. How we'll praise the Savior for the call we had. Keep on the firing line. When we see the slaves that we have helped to win, leading them to Jesus from the paths of sin. With a shout of welcome, we will all march in. So keep on the firing line. Oh, you must fight, be brave against all evil. Never run, nor even lag behind. If you would win for God and the right, just keep on the firing line. If you Thank you, Mountain Band. We got to practice just before the service. I was gone all week. So I said, how are we going to do this? Well, we'll get all the servants together and show up at 9.15 and go over a song. We've done that one before. And uh, thank you, Mountain Band, for doing that. All right. Philippians chapter 1, please. Philippians chapter 1. Um, you know, I took a couple days to go to the... Big Ben, my brother, I said, what's around here to do in Central Texas? He said, well, you go to the coast, but it's going to rain. So we're a half, uh, two couple hours away from uh, Galveston, and I thought, I'd like to see the uh, ocean. I haven't seen it in a number of years to make sure it's still there. I know the promise of God is that it shall not exceed its bounds, and it will continue to be until the moon and stars fall. Uh, he's going to keep all that going until he finishes his plan. However, I kind of like to look at it once in a while to see it. I went to Pensacola. My kids were in Pensacola. It was great because we would take them there and say, okay, you're in class or you're in school now. And then we take them to the beach. You know, we look, they get registered and then before classes start and we go to the beach and I'd always forget something to sit on because I'm not a real good swimmer. I don't go out into the ocean. I saw sharks. That's scary enough. Not going to do it. Anyway, I would dip my toes a little bit. Went to Thailand, same thing. All morning long, they were speaking in Thai, and the classes were all in Thai. So I, as the guest speaker, was expected to do my thing in the evening. So in the morning, I went, and they said, you might as well just go to the beach and read and relax and enjoy the beach and go out if you want to swim. And I said, I don't have sharks in Thailand. I don't know. But anyway... Uh, so, but it was going to rain. I couldn't go to the Galveston Beach or anywhere over there. It says, I'm not going if it's 76 percent cent chance of rain. It says, where is less chance of rain? She says, have you been to Big Ben? I said, no, but the Sizemores went. And Carl liked it and Jane hated it. So, I don't know. I might just do it. And I'd forgotten you hated it until you reminded me you didn't really care for it and you will not go back. On the other hand, I went and it's only 35 percent chance of rain. Hey, I'll tell you next week what happened, because I think uh, the Lord has a, gave me a, a, a message while I was in my uh, room there, looking out of the lodge and seeing the beautiful scenery and uh, watching the rain come down. <laughs> so uh, I read it to you this morning, but I am going to share it with you next week. I'm just The Lord says, why don't you share what I shared with you when you couldn't go out hiking and you had to stare at the big rain clouds? I said, okay, I will do that. So next week I'll tell you all about that. Uh, incident. But uh, so uh, while I was there, I just, um, I enjoyed so much the blessing of the creation when I finally got out and was able to get around. I went down to the Rio Grande. I'm working on a song now about the Rio Grande, about sitting by the Rio Grande, you know, and uh, I might share that with you at some point. Uh, I stole it from a 60s song way back in the day, and you would know it right away. Dan w would know it, for, or Don, excuse, Don would know it for sure. Um, but um, you know, my uh, apologies to whoever wrote the original tune, but I've changed it a little bit. How did you know that? You are a genius, Thomas. You are a genius. So everybody who knows that song back in our day, I changed it around. So uh, anyway, uh, the, the surprise is gone now, but I got to work out the words a little bit better in my lyrics. But anyway, had a great time. It was refreshing, even though it didn't do exactly what I thought would 
uh, happen about it. So, uh, but one of the things I did is though I thought about our progression in the Christian life, I want to talk to you a little bit about the issues of um, what Paul did in the book of Philippians. Now, if you're a, if you, when you're a first saved, as I first saved and I started reading commentaries about the scriptures, now, always use them to help support what you know about the Bible. Don't go to a commentary to learn and say, well, you know, I, I need to find out what the Bible, you know. If you read it and you compare spiritual with spiritual, and then you want to get other people's opinion, then that's what commentaries are for. But every commentary that is written will give you the theme of uh, Philippians as being um, rejoicing. And that is very true. It is a book about rejoicing. But when you start to look at it a little bit deeper, you see that within that theme of rejoicing, Paul had something to say about your Christian life's progression. Now, it's about progress in your spiritual walk. And that's really what our whole our whole life after we've come to know Christ is about that progression to Christ's likeness. If you turn over from chapter 1 to chapter 3 for just a moment here, you find that's what Paul spoke about, about that progression. He says, he says, uh, he says I am trying to know him. I want to know him in verse 10. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his, fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's saying, I am, I am uh, seeking something here in my Christian life. It is not the end. Once I got saved and I'm on my way to heaven, then it's all good and it's all done. No. The adventure is just beginning then. And Paul said, not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect. I haven't made it yet. I've got a journey to take here. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. In other words, Christ has seized me for his own. When I kneeled to him and said, Lord, I take you as my Lord and Savior, he grabbed me up and he says, now you are mine. Go therefore into all the world. Preach the gospel. He's got something for me to do. He had a beginning for me of service, of opportunities to, to share what God had done for me. And so Paul says, I'm following after which Christ apprehended me for something. Paul put it differently in Ephesians in chapter 2, and he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. When I got saved, according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For then it says, we are his workmanship. It says, I'm saved by grace through faith, but then... He's got something for me to do. He ordained something in my life. Just as Jeremiah was told, from a womb I have ordained thee and chose thee as a prophet for my people. God's got something in store for you. His great plan. While we're going in Sunday school through the great names of God, Jehovah, Adonai, Elohim, uh, El Shaddai we talked about today, the great Almighty God, the one that uh, President, uh, former President Trump invoked after his assassination attempt when he was receiving the nomination to be president from the Republican Party. He stood up and he said, he said uh, I am here today only by the grace of Almighty God. El Shaddai saved and protected me. He didn't know that probably. Didn't know that that term, all God Almighty, is about the El Shaddai, the one who is operational in all things, the one who blessed Jacob and Joseph and, and uh, Abraham through the covenant. That's the kind of God we serve, the one who's in control. That's why we need not fear. But here, Paul says, I'm chasing after. He says, I, don't, I haven't comprehended. I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God is not an occupation. It's not a vocation. It is a position. Position of Christ-likeness. And my position in Christ is complete. My practice, however, needs to be progressing toward that. You see, we need to not confuse, and back to chapter 1 here, you should never confuse progressing as a Christian in your Christian life with progressing to become a Christian. Some people are very confused about this. They're told that you 
are working toward heaven. You're taking certain steps, and you follow these steps, and the church outlines what these steps must be and what you must do. And if you do these things, then maybe perhaps, if God is merciful, you can enter into heaven. If not, then there's some other stages you're going to have to go through. Too bad for you. It doesn't sound like a great uh, comforting thing, and of course it's not. A work salvation is never something that you have confidence in, because you never know if you've done enough works. You never know if you've done enough things. You never know if you've done enough following the steps exactly as you're supposed to in order to reach that level where you can be admitted to heaven. Well, the Bible speaks about uh, conversion happening in an instant. In a moment, you turn from darkness to light. That's what happens. You know, uh, I know when the sun comes up, it progresses to get lighter and lighter. But when you get hit by the sun, you find out the truth of, of Psalm 19, where it says nothing is hid from the heat thereof. And if you've never experienced Central Texas, down by San Antonio, New Brunfels, my brother-in-law smiling because he has experienced, it is miserable. You don't go to Texas in July and August, late July and August, and it's not when you go, you go in March. I went in March the first time and it was wonderful. We did the river walk in San Antonio. We ate outside and looked at the beautiful 70-something degree temperatures and blue skies. This is great. But in July and August, it is a steaming swamp. And I took a walk outside my brother's house and they have a you know, acreages there. There's just not one right next to another. So several acres of property. And so I walked down the roads, were up and down like this. And so I got a pretty good workout. And I got my cardio up. I didn't have a Fitbit, so I couldn't tell you how much. People would ask those questions now. What'd your Fitbit tell you? It told me nothing because I don't have it. But my heart told me something. I could hear it in my ears. And when I hear it in my ears, I know, hey, it's working pretty good. So I was going up and down. And I just... Uh, I got back and my t-shirt was just soaked. I had to change clothes, take a shower. I said, this is, this is rough, this heat. And when I, I, the sun would go behind a cloud, I could immediately feel the temperature drop five degrees, 10 degrees, and stay behind that cloud a little while longer, sun, would you? And I'd walk a little more and then it would come out. And immediately the exact opposite would happen, the five degrees and then the 10 degrees. And, and you're just, ah, uh, you know, being beat by that. That's uh, uh, the sun is, is intense. The minute it happens, you know it's there. When salvation happens, it happens instantaneously. You are transferred from the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of the of his son. Don't confuse that with what Paul is saying here. Otherwise, you'll come to some place like uh, in, in chapter 2, where it talks about uh, uh, it's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 12 of chapter 2, it says, But now, much now in my absence, wherefore you always beloved and believed and obeyed in my presence, now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And right away you get into the confusion of progress. You're working it out, working your salvation out to, to get it. And that is not what this verse means. It's not what Paul is teaching at all. He's teaching about you progressing because you're a Christian, not to become a Christian. The moment you receive Christ, in fact, he mentioned that here. He mentioned it in verse 2, Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, uh, being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform in the day of Jesus Christ. That's not your salvation. That's your sanctification. And a couple weeks ago we talked about that on a Wednesday night. Sanctification. Every Christian should know the difference between your salvation, being born again, as Jesus said, from above, in John 3, and then working out your salvation. When I walk, took that walk, I was out for a little exercise. But it turned out to be more of exercise than I wanted. Big, sweepy hills down like this, coming up, the sun out, pounding down on me, then the blessing and mercy of God when the shade came and 10 degrees dropped in temperature and I felt a little better, and out comes the sun again, and that whole process continued on and continued on. That's uh, the issue of the Christian life. Sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, the heat of the intensity of the battle, and sometimes it's the the blessing and the coolness of the shade of the of uh, the tree of life where you sit under and you enjoy that uh, and uh, have the coolness of God's love upon you. Hey, progressing. That's what this is about. It's about progressing. It's about continuing on. 
And he believed it was so important for the Philippians that he could say, I think I'm going to be around for a while. He says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. I'm in jail now. That's why rejoicing is a great theme for this book, and it is. But progressing is also. Because while Paul was in jail, and he was still rejoicing, and he was saying in chapter 2, rejoice in the Lord, and again I say rejoice, he also was concerned about the Philippians. And so he said, I'm in a strait betwixt two, in verse 23, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He says, God's going to spare my life, not because of me, that I'm the great apostle Paul, though God had a great plan already laid out for Paul, but for them. Because he said, I need to be part of your progression in godliness. And so God's sparing me so I can be with you. And so in verse uh, 25, he said, having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue. How could he know that? How can he know that the crazy guys in charge of that, you know, the pharaoh, the pharaohs, <laughs> the Neros, the Caesars of that day, they were not nice people. They didn't give account to anybody. There was not a board looking at them and saying, hey, if you take a life uh, unnecessarily, then the government's going to step in and we're going to watch everything you do. No, they were the government. And they said, live or die, up or down. That's how it went. And Paul could have lost his life, but he said, no, I know I'm not going to. Because there's something more important here. Not my life. My life's already given to Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so he said, not about me. It's about you. Your progress needs to continue. I'm confident. The very thing which had begun a good work in you. I was there when that beginning happened. I was there in jail and beaten and the jailer and the earthquake and the jailer getting saved. And I was there just for a short time, but it began. And it's now going to continue. God is going to perform it until that day of Jesus Christ. All of us require that growth process. All of us are involved in that, in ourselves and helping someone else to grow. And Paul believed his life would be spared for the Philippians. Notice it says that in verse uh, number 25. I I will abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. What's that word furtherance? What's that mean? Progress. Progress. Furtherance of joy and faith. I'm a progressive. I really am. Not the way you think about it. Because I see a lot of political minds going, woo, 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 woo. we may have to just do something about our church membership here. We've got a progressive in the pulpit. No, I believe in our progression like Paul did. I believe it's so important, that's why I'm here. I'm here for me to grow. I'm here for you to grow as well. I have a confidence. Paul had it. He said, I'm getting out of jail because your progress, making some more progressives out of, the re- of you, that's what's important. That's what's necessary. And he went and fought back to this, such an extent that while he was in jail, he says, I think I'm going to get out. I believe I'm going to get out. I have confidence I'm going to get out. Uh, you know, he wasn't claiming, you know, he had, you know, knowledge more than God. But he was saying, when this happens, I probably will be there before Timothy, but I'm going to send him to you. I'm going to send him to you, he says in chapter 2, that you may know the proof of him, that he is helping you, uh, you know, he's, he's the one who's going to help you grow now. He's the one who's helped you progress. He says, you have another man who naturally cares for your soul, for all seek their own, and not the things that are Christ Jesus, but I can send Timothy, and he will do the work. He will help you. He will do the planting, if you will, and the cultivating. I'm going to come. And I'm going to see the fruit of it. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And not only that, I'm going to send back Epaphroditus to you. He was sent him to me with a gift. And I received those things. In chapter 4, he spoke the things that he had received. He talked about the mission reception of a mission gift that was given to him. I received the thing. I am full. I'm satisfied. I know you didn't need to send a gift. But he says, I desire not the, not the gift, but the fruit abounding to your account. 
They say, you've been gracious to me and you sent that I'm full. I, re I think that it wasn't just an issue of some money that came to help him support himself, but I think there was some good, you know, edibles there. Oh, shouldn't say it that way, right? Not, not in a marijuana state that is, you know, you know, we can do this. Not, but there were some nummies. That's how we say it. Those little nummies. The kids love nummies. When they were real small, they'd find nummies on the carpet. No, no, you can't eat that one. But he looked at that and he says, I've received it. And God receives it too. He says, it is a sacrifice pleasing unto God. A sweet smell that comes up. Your sacrifice is worthy. Whatever you give to the missionaries, that is a worthy sacrifice. Please take note of it. God sees it. There's a reward for you because of it. And Paul said, I needed growth for you. That's the whole point. We're growing so we can be encouragement one to another. Now, there are three things quickly that I'm going to share with you in just the last few minutes I've got that help this issue of progress. And I want to share them quickly, because I know after we're done with here, we're going to enjoy fellowshipping again and around the, the special ice cream, which I can't wait to get. I'm having some of both kinds because it's a bar, you know. My brother, it's come to my mind. You, you, you shouldn't have done this to me, ice cream bar. Matt, you'll like this one. So my brother tells me, did you hear about the, the peanut that walked into the bar? And I said, no. He says, he was assaulted. Maybe there'll be some peanuts to put on my ice cream. I'm not sure about that. Rejoicing in God's progress in our spiritual life. All right, back to chapter 1. Now I want you to come down to verse, we looked at verse 6. And he says he, how much he loved them in verse 8. He said how much they were in his heart in verse 7. In verse 9, now he says, I'm praying for you. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and all judgment. The very first thing that's going to be necessary for us to progress in our spiritual life, in godliness, this progression that Paul spoke about, seizing the likeness of Christ that Christ has seized us for, is love. Is love. Now, the love word here is the word agape, there are a couple other ones. Eros is a, is a sensual love. That's used in the New Testament. There is the phileo. That is the love of the common, commonality, the love of, of, a, of a brother, Philadelphos, Delphos brother, philo love. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of brotherly love in Philadelphia, if I understand things right. But what do I know? Uh, City of Angels, Los Angeles. That's not what I hear about when I hear City of Angels uh, being talked about on the news. Uh, we turned away from uh, the Lord, and so the names of these towns might have represented something at some point. They don't anymore. But this idea of agape is a word that really kind of got generated through the Christian message. It wasn't used a lot in classical Greek, was my understanding. But it is a, basically the love of an intelligent purpose. It is a love that is distinct from the others by far. In fact, that is why this word agape, agapao in its other form, where it was, uh, was coined by Christians, began to be used by Christians because phileo couldn't describe it exactly. Eros certainly couldn't. And so it had to be something else. It had to be this love that's connected to God. And that's what it always is. It's deflected from Him, reflected from Him to us. And so there's some things about this love we need to understand. It comes from Him. It originates in the person of God. Divine love, agape. It's the part of love that is sacrificial. It's the part of love that ultimately is decisive. It makes choices. It chooses. I love the song, and I haven't sung it in a long time, but I dragged the words out to share with you. But it's called, I Choose Jesus. He said, my Lord chose death one day at Calvary. He chose the pain and guilt to make me free. Upon himself he placed my sin and shame. He chose to die that I might live again. And then the chorus says, And I choose Jesus. I choose life. The life he freely gave that lasts beyond the grave. I choose his own to be throughout eternity. I choose Jesus, my Lord. And then the second verse says, He chose to leave 
his father's heavenly throne. He chose a cross and an earthly crown of thorns. The path of tears he chose that I might see. The way to joy and perfect victory. And then the chorus again, I choose Jesus. I'm choosing life. I'm choosing him. That is exactly what Paul is saying. I want your agape, your love, to abound in something that is decisive. And unfortunately, sometimes we look at this idea of, of love and we, we use the world's paradigm. We use their, 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 uh, their view of it, their model of it. And that's basically really selfish. It's basically eros. And it's basically perversion now. And they say that's love. And if, it's, if we love each other, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter about gender. It doesn't matter about this. It doesn't matter about that. And all of a sudden, God's principles and purpose for marriage are violated. And we sit there and wonder, we scratch, how can we get so far away from what God says? Because we've chosen to. We've chosen those things. We've allowed them to take place. It's impulsive what the world does. It is, it is reflective what the Christian does about love. Listen to John Stott wrote this. He said, uh, Many modern Christians have zeal without knowledge, enthusiasm without enlightenment. In more modern jar jargon, they are keen but clueless. We have lots of passion, often of sentimental and crassly nar uh, narcissistic sort, but little thinking. Mindlessness is virtually equated with godliness in the modern church. The video age has swamped us, and the result is the loss of clear thinking with more sound bites, i.e. little bits of information. We have uh, no longer, uh, have, uh, no longer com infomercials. They're too long, which move the will against directly, uh, move the will almost directly without prompting serious reflection and thought. Preaching, if we can still even call it that, is aimed at being short, relevant, and moving. Modern worshipers do not want to think they want to feel something. That's it. Now, I want you to feel something too. I want you to feel God's power and presence in your life. And I know that's only going to come from the Word of God. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Where do we get the blessing and direction from God about our life, about our direction, about our sins, how to take care of that? It's not that we feel it. It's that we cognitively understand it and then we act upon it. It's a decisive love. Jesus was decisive. I choose to go to the cross for you. The Son of Man has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. The issue is very clear. Abounding love is decisive. It's dynamic. It grows stronger as it's exercised. You start loving people, why? Not with an emotion, but with an act of a will. To say, I will direct my love toward this person means I will do acts of kindness and, and generous and, and be gentle. And I will be direct in my, my issue of saving grace to them. That's loving. That's decisive. That's dynamic. Paul's prayed for more growth and expansion in this. I pray that your love would abound yet more and more in all judgment. Start thinking about how you can direct your love to people. You, I've got to feel something first. No, you do something first, and then after a while, guess what? Well, you feel really good about it. The Lord's telling me, encourage me to do something, do something, talk to someone, call someone, and I say, oh, i got to put that, I'll do that later, and he keeps on it. And when I finally do, I recognize, wow, I needed that. I was supposed to encourage that person, and guess what? They encouraged me. And the Lord goes, I told you, you'll get a blessing. I, I want you to grow. I want you to experience the blessing. But you have to be obedient. You have to be willing. It's dynamic. It functions. Don't settle for mediocrity in your Christian life. Start saying, Lord, there's got to be more, and reach for it. And watch God do something great. I'm going to direct my love to this unlovely individual right now. It's a person I really don't like their personality. I don't like how they act but I am going to direct my love to that person. In doing so, you become like Christ. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why? God commended his love, his agape toward us while we're sinners. Bounding love. It's also a love that is discerning. It looks, it's careful. 
It, uh, it, it beholds the things that are good and equal. That's how Proverbs chapter 2 says, My son, thou will receive my words, hide my commandments with thee. So thou shalt incline thine ear into wisdom, apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after, uh, after her uh, uh, with, as silver and gold, and seekest her as silver and gold, and search for his hid treasures, thou shalt understand the fear of God, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He lay up sound wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, preserveth the way of his saints. God says, I've got a way for you. I've got wisdom for you. I've got understanding for you. Oh, walk in my ways. Be obedient. I don't feel like it. Who cares? Be obedient. Be dutiful. The whole duty of man. Love God and keep his commandments. Here's the whole end of the matter, Solomon said. And I talk about a long preacher. Whoa. He could get going. You think I'm long. If you sat under Solomon for a while, that'd be miserable, wouldn't it? Or would it? It just depends on your perspective. Number two, approving excellence, verse 10, that we may approve things that are excellent. What does growth do for me? It makes me start filtering out the things that are not so important in this world anymore. Uh, approving good things are fine. It, the Bible tells us about that word, prove and approve. It's uh, basically testing and then learning from what you test to know something that is experienced. So I learned that Central Texas in July and August, and you know, I actually knew this because I was in Dallas one July to see Pastor Singletary when he was sick, and then I went back when my brother was sick. So I guess sick people draw me in the middle of the heat season. And so I knew that up there in Dallas, but hey, this is the central part. This is further south. Well, it didn't get any better that way. I proved it. I learned it. I knew that in central Texas, you're going to be hot in the summertime, especially August and end of July. And Paul said this. He says, you're not to be conformed to this world. Be transferred by the renewing of your mind. Because you may be able to prove, you may be able to test what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may know it experientially. That's what proving it is. You talk to the scientist guys around here, the uh, engineers around here, well, just, I guess you, Carl, that's you, Matt, and they test things. They test to prove and see if this theory is right about this, if it's going to work under these circumstances. So they try it, and they work, and they find out whether it works or not. That's what Paul is saying here. He says, prove. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, don't walk in darkness, you're children of light. He says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Experience His will, his word, and you'll prove that it will work in your life. It'll be functional. Walk as uh, circumspectly, not as fools. Discerning love, that's what it is. Well, approve that which is excellent. And then pursue integrity. He goes on further there and says uh, in verse 10, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. Sincerity, we kind of know it when we see it. Um, sometimes people are, have a false sincerity. Oh, pastor, that was the greatest message I've heard since Michael the Archangel preached back in the day. That sort of sincerity, no, that's flattery. And I know it's not true, so don't try that one. Well, Paulus, you could compare me with Paul. No comparisons, all right? The issue of sincerity is something that is absolutely uh, without fault. Being sincere doesn't mean that I, I uh, am always right. It means that what I have, what I believe, what I've done is what I can do. Now, I came across this, uh, and I don't read a lot of uh, Boyce, but uh, James Montgomery Boyce said this. He said, in ancient times, this is an issue of pottery. The finest pottery was very thin. It had clear color, and it brought a high price. Fine pottery was very fragile, both before and after firing. And the, this pottery would often crack in the oven. Cracked pottery would have been thrown away, but dishonest, not sincere, dishonest dealers were in the habit of filling cracks with hard, pearly wax that would blend in with the color of the pottery. 
This made the cracks practically undetectable in the shops, especially when painted or glazed. But the wax was immediately detectable if the pottery was held up to the light, especially to the sun. In that case, the cracks would show up darker. It was said that the artificial element was detected by sun testing. Honest dealers marked their finer products with the caption, sine sere, which meant without wax. So we have this treasure in earthen vessels, and when it's held up to the light, your clay pot, you have a presentation you make here in church which is all fine and good. But out there in the workaday world, out there where the, the rubber meets the road, how sincere are you? Where are the faults, the cracks in your pot fixed with the wax? They can be seen. This idea here is that there's no need because this person's complete. They're integral. They're, they're pursuing integrity. There's wholeness there. That's the idea. We're pursuing that which we are being pursued from Jesus Christ, like Him, which means I'm going to live my life honestly before the Gentiles. I'm going to be careful about my life. Pursuing integrity. True, honest, forthright. Does that mean perfect? No. Doesn't mean perfect. I'm sure that even the finest pottery, there were imperfections and then they could be found. They were just inherent in the nature of the clay. But there wasn't a, 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 a insidious uh, deception that was insincere, covered with flattery. Pursue integrity. That's what he wants us to do. Without offense. To the day of Christ, that's all. And Paul said, I have, I, I've sought to live my life completely without offense to man and God. That's what he told his, his, uh, his uh, uh, in, uh, interrogators when he was before them. That's what I've tried to do. I, I'm not trying to do anything else than live like God tells me to live. Why? Because I'm progressing. And what happens when that happens? Well, in verse 11 it says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness whereby Jesus Christ and the glory and praise of God. What happens when we do that? Fruits of righteousness. It's the fruit of the Spirit that starts to develop in our life. We sometimes don't recognize the completeness of that work that is continuing on. But Paul understood it. He said, I'm going to be spared. I'm going to be spared from death so I can go back and help you progress in your spiritual life. I'm going to do it so that you can be whole and complete before God, and the fruits of righteousness will be seen in your life. And all of a sudden, guess what? It's Christ that gets the glory. It's Christ that gets the praise. Oh, I wish we had more of that in our real progressive movements. Where someone says, it's not about me. I'm not the greatest thing, but by the grace of God, Almighty God, I am what I am. That's what Paul said. Progression. We all need it. How far are you going? How far are you willing to go to be like Christ? Good question to answer. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time together now. We need you. We ask you to help us to progress in our spiritual walk. We need that sincerity in our life. We need that integrity in our life. We need that uh, abounding love that is decisive and dynamic and discerning. We need that, Lord. Please help us to that end. To continue pursuing our Lord Jesus. Wherever he leads, we will follow. I pray you'd help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, please. And what number do we have, Brother Matt? 325 is our final hymn. <laughs> Altars open to talk to the Lord if you need to pray. If you need some help, I'll help you. Talk me and tender me, Jesus, it's for me.
Thank you. 